I can still uh, remember it pretty vividly. Um, you know, so um, small team of folks in Monsanto. Um, myself, Rob Horsch, Steve Rogers, Ernie Jaworski. Uh, we were working uh, to try to figure out how to put uh, these new genes into plants, how to use biotechnology tools. And, uh, you know, we were uh, trying all kinds of different approaches. And one day, uh, I remember Rob Horsch running down the hallway saying it worked, it worked, it worked. And, uh, you know, the, what we'd been able to demonstrate was that uh, we, could, uh, we could introduce the gene into a plant cell, the gene would work, it would create a, uh, the ability of the plant cell to grow. And if you didn't have the gene, the plant cells didn't grow. So it was just night and day. One, one plate was green and, and full of plant cells, and the other one was, was brown and didn't work, and, and it was it. And then once that happened, uh, we knew we had a system that would work, and we started applying it to, uh, to uh, cotton and corn and, uh, and soybean. And, and I think the thing that, you know, that you know, Monsanto just really deserves the credit for is, you know, they started investing in this area of plant science literally in the late 70s. Uh, we had the, the breakthrough moment in 83, and then it was another 13 years before the first products were sold. So uh, a long patient investment in, a, uh, in an area that has been, you know, exciting from a science perspective and I think, you know, really uh, dramatic for, uh, for agriculture and for farmers. You know, I think from a pure science perspective, uh, the team knew it was a big deal because no one in the world had ever put a gene into a plant cell and then have the ability to regenerate that cell into a, into a plant and then the plant would go through its own production of seed and then the seeds we could test and show that gene, you know, was part of that seed just like any other gene. And so within a short period of time, we were able to establish the whole principle for how you would insert uh, the, the genes into, into plants. Now, what we, we couldn't have predicted, and it still you know, kind of blows me away today, you know, you know since their launch in, uh, in 96, you know, uh, all of the biotech products uh, today are planted uh, you know, on about 25% of the world's farmland. They're planted in 30 countries. Uh, they're planted by tens of millions of farmers. And there's, uh, there's absolutely no way I think we would have expected to have, you know, this kind of prolific adoption of the technology. Uh, yeah, so when I joined Monsanto, I, I would describe it. It was a, it was a industrial chemical company. Uh, we, uh, we uh, we made uh, everything from uh, from uh, you know chemical products uh, and uh, agricultural chemicals to uh, plastics and uh, probably best known for wear dated carpet and astroturf. So we we were for sure uh, an industrial chemical company. I think the the, the thinking w was a little bit of twofold. Um, one was there were, were you were just starting to see in other fields how biotechnology could create products. So if you think about back in the 80s, the, the first of the pharmaceutical biotech products were, were starting to take place. So scientists had cloned the, the growth hormone gene or the gene for tissue plasminic inactivator, which helps for heart attack victims. So these very specific, very rare proteins could now be produced in bacteria in large quantities and, and really provide tremendous breakthrough for, uh, for patients. So that path was being laid and um, what we wanted to be able to do was to do the same thing with, uh, with crops and, uh, and that's really the, uh, you know, the excitement and the focus that, that uh, had never been done before. So there was an excitement of an opportunity and then I think to be fair, you know, folks were looking at some of the existing you know, chemical businesses and, and believing that at that point in time that you know, they, were, they were starting to slow down, they were starting to plateau and, and biotech could represent a, a new you know, growth platform for the company. And you know, you look today at Monsanto. Uh, you know, the company is uh, is completely an ag company, and it's completely a, a biotech and life science company. So, uh, you know, the the transformation happened.
Roundup Ready Soybeans was, uh, was a pretty magical experience. Um, we, uh, we launched in 96, and I can, a um, couple things I remember. Um, you could drive along the interstates, and you could pick out the fields that were Roundup Ready because they were completely clean, and there wasn't a weed. And you go by the conventional technology at the time, and you'd see a couple of milkweeds here and a few other uh, weeds, and the Roundup you know, fields were, uh, were clean. And then, and then it got to be more important. Uh, because a lot of people don't appreciate that the, there were multiple benefits of the Roundup Ready technology. One was it, it controlled the weeds. But the, probably the most important thing the Roundup Ready technology did was give the growers the confidence that the weeds could be controlled and that enabled them to move to conservation tillage and reduce tillage. And that really helps conserve moisture and topsoil. And I think that's really a key to the reason that we could see corn and soybeans start to be planted farther north and farther west uh, in areas that had traditionally been too dry because this technology you know, conserved soil moisture and, uh, and really, I think, had a big uh, role to play in the migration of the Corn Belt uh, you know, north and west. You know, I think about it every once in a while, but I also think about, you know, all those farmers and all those countries that are using the uh, the technology. Uh, I think, you know, one of the, the really, you know, cool things about, you know, being a World Food Prize recipient is this is a this is an opportunity to to reset the dialogue. And I think, you know, we're so caught up sometimes in the uh, discussions that are going on, and you know, it's always important to remember that. You know, we're really talking about voices on either side of the curve. You know, there's a, a small number of folks with pretty loud voices that don't like the technology. And, you know, there's folks like myself who've been, you know, working in the science and, you know, we're advocates. I'm an advocate because I, I absolutely believe in the safety and the benefits. But there's a whole lot of people in the middle who, who don't wake up every morning talking or thinking about biotech. And I think, you know, that group is one where I think the the logic and discussion around food security and food prices and you know tools that can help you know reduce the environmental impact of agriculture are important and so I think we really need to turn our attention much more you know to the consumer to the housewife to the mom and really take our message you know to you know the consumer directly and that's something we really haven't done much we've uh, we've sparred on either end of the curve but now it's really important that we take our message uh, you know, to the consumer. Well, you know, I'm excited by, you know, what we've seen in terms of the, uh, the uh, adoption of the technology. You know, farmers around the world in 30 countries and are growing this technology and it's been far beyond anything I could have imagined. But the, the two parts of that that I think are really important to talk about uh, and it relates to you know some of the you know the criticism sometimes you hear around biotech. Uh, first of all, you know biotechnology now you know it's almost going to be an old science. You know the first recombinant experiments were done in the 70s, and you know we made our first plants in the 80s, and we launched our first products in the 90s. So you know biotech you know seeds and, and foods have been you know made since for the last 20 years. The importance of that is in. 20 years, there's not been a single food or feed safety issue. And I'm really proud of the, of the track record that this technology has had from a point of view of its, uh, its absolute you know, stellar track record of safety. The, the other thing that, again, I, you know, and unless you're really close to it, people don't appreciate, is most of the farmers who use biotech are outside the U.S., and most of those are smallholder farmers. And uh, the, the beauty of, of the biotech science is that you're, you're taking the latest advances in gene cloning and gene sequencing and gene mapping, you're putting it all into that seed, and you can give that seed to a small farmer in India or China or Africa, and they'll get enormous benefit from it because every farmer knows what to do with the seed. And so it comes as close to being scale neutral as any technology that I know of that's been developed. And that gives it the opportunity to have a broad impact 
to large and small farmers all around the world. Really, uh, really exciting uh, company with cool technology. Um, I think it's a nice build on what we're doing because if you think about it, what our science lets us do is kind of reprogram that seed with new information that makes it yield and perform better. And the next logical step is give the farmer more information on how and when to plant that seed and how to take care of that seed to optimize its yield. And a, a lot of the data tools that are available, and particularly the Climate Corp capability, I think will give growers much more insight into how to make decisions in their farming operations to optimize yield. Uh, so simple decisions like uh, what exactly is the very best time to plant? And, and which of the 40 fields that a farmer might have should be planted first. And as you then start to go through the next set of decisions that can be weather related or data related, um, I think there's a real opportunity to use the near term weather predictions to again give growers better insight as when to do a disease treatment you know, when might they need to start thinking about scouting for a, an insect outbreak? And a lot of that knowing the genetics in the field, knowing the topography of the field, you know, the, the soil type and the moisture levels, and, you know, maybe knowledge of, you know, past cropping history, and weather prediction can be used, I think, to give growers that, that next bit of, uh, of insight. And I think what's, what's really exciting about it, and it's also just like the biotech seed itself, is this is very scale neutral. So, you know, in the U.S., our model may be to send a, a signal to the computer on the farmer's tractor. In India or China, it may be to send a text message on the farmer's cell phone that says the wind currents are changing, there's likely to be a, a flight of moths in the next two or three days that will be laying eggs that could create a caterpillar outbreak. Be ready. And, and, and that's what I think we can gain from combining the advances in biology with the advances in information technology and really, and really provide a real-time agronomic recommendation to farmers around the world. Well, the, uh, the first thing I would do was say um, this is going to be an incredibly exciting industry. Uh, so from a business perspective, it's a great thing to think about, you know, as a career path, whether you're a scientist or, a, you know, an agronomist or a, or a plant breeder. Uh, I also think that it's probably one of the most important both opportunities and challenges that anyone can think about in terms of a, an investment or a career. Uh, you know, the UN has just raised the projections for world population by 2050 to be uh, 9.6 billion people. So 37 years from now, or probably about the time you guys are my age, uh, this is your world. And uh, we will have to double the amount of food. And it sounds really quick. If you, know, if you say that really quick, it sounds easy. When we put in the context that doubling the world's food supply by 2050 means the world produces more food than it ever has in its entire history. So the, 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 the challenge of doing this and getting it right is going to be really critical to food security, you know, to our land and water resources. And if we don't get it right, it's going to create concerns with, uh, you know, with, with, you know, hunger or political instability. And so I think it's really, uh, really important that, uh, you know, people are excited by the science, they're challenged by the opportunity, but there's, a, there's an important mission here to take on. Brought to you by the Agribusiness Association of Iowa for the purpose of communicating and educating a responsible, professional agribusiness industry.